We begin in West Africa, where the Central Bank of Nigeria has raised its benchmark interest rate, known as the monetary policy rate, to 22.75 percent. This is the highest MPC rate increase ever, now coming for the first time in eight months. The cash reserve requirement was increased to 45 percent. This was announced by the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, that's Olayemi Kadoso, who chaired the Monetary Policy Committee meeting for the first time since he assumed office in September 2023. In 2023, Nigeria's MPC adopted a distinct approach, steadily increasing the NPR across four consecutive meetings, ultimately reaching a substantial 18.75 percent by the end of the year. We are working hard. We are putting out our policies. We are trying to avoid as much as possible not to go against the grain and the spirit of what we, we've, we've said we would do. We're trying to be as open and transparent as possible. We are bearing the interests of all Nigerians in view with any decisions we are taking. We are ensuring that we put the country above individuals. Because, like I said before, and it also applies to this, Nigeria does not have the wiggle room to make failed interventions. Rate finance expert Tilewa Adebaju. Thank you for your time, Tilewa. Good evening. How are you? Very well. Now, many analysts have predicted an increase in interest rate as the outcome of the NPC, and now we have it at 22.75%. Uh, I mean, what are your thoughts? Well, it's a step in the right direction given the conditions in the economy so far. Um, if you take a look at money supply, money supply is now at 93 trillion. Uh, this time last year, money, uh, money supply was only 53 trillion. So you have seen an increase of money supply by 40 trillion naira in just one year. Uh, so that shows you the amount of liquidity in the system. Inflation is now at 30%. Real rates and real yields are negative. And I think since July last year, um, NPR was set at 18.75. We haven't seen such an increase. So in the whole of last year, we saw maybe about a 700 basis point increase in interest rates. Hard. And with this move, we have seen just 400, which is good, because what will happen is that, for me, the ideal rate to bring inflation down to 21% will be 25% uh, 25 NPR. So I guess the central bank is working towards 25% because the target for inflation reduction for this year is 21%. And if the central bank can achieve that target of getting 21% um, you know, inflation rate this year, it will be fantastic for the economy because we begin to restore value and return to real rates. There's too much liquidity in the system. Mm. And I think combined with that, you've seen a 45% uh, CRR, which is also quite stringent, but necessary, given the fact that we have too much liquidity in the system, and this liquidity is not going towards, you know, investment for growth and development, but instead, a lot of this liquidity is going towards speculation and chasing the Naira. So we need to rein it in. So I think all in all, it's a move in the right direction, given the conditions of the economy today. All right. Now, still talking about uh, inflation, some have argued that the cash push inflation can actually be curtailed by, you know, rising the inflation rate. Now, is this uh, what Nigeria is experiencing and what other mechanism can, you know, the Apex Bank use to actually tackle uh, inflation? Well, that's the, that's, those are the measures they've used to tighten. Number one is they have used the interest rates. The NPR has gone up. Uh, you've seen the CRR has also gone up, and now they're beginning to use more of open market operation, which is orthodox, 
that is selling treasury bills and other instruments to the market at higher interest rates, which will mop up the excess liquidity. That uh, mopping up and higher yield instruments, instead of people chasing FX, people can now begin to invest in high yield instruments. And one of the main things that you look at from an investment cycle is a yield curve. If you have a yield curve that is negative, then real yields and, and uh, real returns are going to be negative. So by increasing interest rates on the short term, you will achieve some price stability and bring down inflation. Once you've brought down inflation to about 11%, then you can begin to cut rates to begin to spur growth. So this is just the first step in restoring Nigeria from stagflation on the path from stagflation to economic growth and recovery. All right. Now, the CBN governor actually aims to tackle inflation and also set the inflation target at about, say, 21 percent. Now, is this actually achievable? Well, this year. Yes. yes. Now, if this is achievable, I mean, when will the average Nigerian start to feel the impact? Uh, I mean, particularly at the micro level. We know the price of food right now. Uh, we know the cost of living and all of that. I mean, there was actually even a protest to that effect today. So, like, uh, how soon do you think the average Nigerian on the street will start to feel the impact of some of these policies? Well, what will happen now is that there's another NPC meeting next month. So if the, if the, government, if the governor looks at the situation and sees that he needs to increase rates some more, then you can look at another rate increase. But within the second quarter of the year, you will see that as inflation month on month begins to reduce, food inflation is at 36. So imagine bringing food inflation down from 36% now to 21%. So right away there, you can begin to see a 15% decrease in food prices. So that will make a major impact on people. But what is important is to take inflation down to about 11% or what is desirable is single digits. So anywhere between 9 to 11% is a desirable rate for inflation in Nigeria. So if we take it from 30 to 21, by the end of this year, you see a significant drop in those sorts of areas. So and then by this time next year, we should be seeing going to from about 20% down to about 15 to 11%. So we're looking at between a six to nine month where you begin to see some, uh, some significant, um, what I'll say, uh, reduction in the rates of inflation. Uh, and then on a sustainable basis, if that is sustained on, uh, over the years and those policies of sustained uh, tightening is sustained over the next six to nine months, it could actually be a lot faster. Mm. Now, another interesting outcome is the CBN affirming that it will not be involved in any more, you know, intervention programs such as the Anchor Burroughs Fund. Now, do you agree with this? Definitely. I mean, the central bank governor said it. Ten, you saw the, the increase in money supply of 40 trillion. Out of that 40 trillion, 10 trillion was intervention and 30 trillion was ways and means. So, and he said that too much of something that you think is good might not be good. That 10 trillion was money that was wasted. People say intervention here, intervention there, but when you spend 10 trillion on an intervention program and you cannot see the desired results, then it's a problem. So you can now see that instead of that 10 trillion going into the real sector and achieving growth and development and spurring growth and creating jobs, reducing unemployment, uh, in increasing our GDP, and growing the economy and increasing productivity, you are seeing that that 10 trillion has fueled inflation. That is all that's happened. So he looked at it as a waste. So we have to do away with that. And all that 10 trillion now, we have to move it to all this Bank of Industry, Development Bank of Nigeria, Bank of Agriculture. They are the ones that have the capacity to manage loans and administer loans. So we have to try and see how much of that we can recover if any, to be able to see some meaningful impact. But it's not the job of central bank to be disbursing development banking loans. The central bank should back uh, Bank of Industry, Bank of Agriculture, Development Bank of Nigeria, Nexim. Those are those intervention banks that the central bank should back and let them go and do the proper intervention because they have the mechanisms to secure the loans. Uh, so that is why it is important because 10 trillion 
is a lot of money that we now have to find a way to recover. Mm. All right. Uh, Tilewa Adebajo, economist and corporate finance expert, thank you for your time. Good evening. Good evening. Now to update on the protest by the Nigeria Labour Congress. The Oyo State Governor, Shea Makinde, on Tuesday joined the state chapter of the Nigeria Labour Congress in its peaceful protest. During the protest, the governor assured the protesters that the current hardship would soon be over. The workers began their protest from the NLC State Secretariat at Godi in Ibadan, the state capital, down to Gate, NTA, Yemen to Roundabout, where the governor, Makinde, joined the protesting workers. The protesting workers are urging the federal government to take immediate proactive measures to alleviate the hardships caused by the removal of your subsidies. <laughs> be on the streets today and tomorrow and paraventure nothing is done there may be an indefinite strike I, i'm aware there is a meeting going on with the national leadership and the federal government let's see whatever comes out of that we are not interested in creating an um, uh, uh, unbearable condition but things are tense already we just have to let the government know that's that's all one, one thing is obvious that uh, people are hungry and that's why they are angry and the authority needs to quickly arrest the situation. And like we have presented and uh, our highlighted demands, agitations to the governor to pass it to the Mr. President, and likewise his colleagues in Nigeria. People, the Nigerian masses are tired already. I am begging you, this problem will be over. We had stop riots in 1989 in this country. We know the end. What we want is bring everything that you think we can do in our state. Give it to me. We will sit down, look at it, and act in the person of our state. In Delta State, the affiliate members of the Nigeria Labour Congress, Delta State Council, in solidarity with Nigerian workers, participated in the mass protest against hunger and hardship across the country. The protesters will begin their protest from the Labour House in Asaba, the state capital, walked through the popular Okmanam and Anwai roads, uh, displaying their various placards with different inscriptions, made a brief stop over at strategic places to register their demands to the federal government over the worsening economic uh, case before arriving at the government house gate, where they were received and addressed by the secretary to the state government. We expect the government to look at the, the interests of the masses to see what they can do, at least to reduce the cost of living. House rent is high, full stuff and everything. Let them look into it and reduce it. That is what we are expecting. We are here to play with the governor to please help us. The masses are weeping. People are dying. No food, no, no thing at all. No light, no water. Our salary yet remains the same. We are here to play with the governor to help us. We have come to make this passionate appeal that our welfare must be looked into. Our minimum wage should be given a reconsideration. That that 30,000 Naira we are talking about can no longer. Even without the federal government implementation of any policy of any kind, we should think about our own internal mechanism, how our people can be better. While we are waiting for the federal government to implement whatever policy that they think is going to benefit the entire Nigerians. But we are here, we are in Delta State, where we know that things are working. And we want to pray and believe that His Excellency will not listen to our plight and cry us to continue to wallow in this abject suffering and poverty. Your plight, your conditions, your concerns, your worries will be taken back to the governor. He will hear them and hear them loud. I'm also sure that they are documented. If they are documented, even if they're not documented, we have recorded the voice message and uh, delivered eloquently by your leadership. So we will take it to them. We are all angry. You are not the only one angry. As citizens of Delta State, we are angry. Because while we protect our state, but we are still vulnerable to the external aggression by people who don't live in this state, who are non-state actors, overrunning state actors. So we are not unmindful of that. We are spending so much money on security to protect lives and properties. It's only those levels of protection that can get our people back to the farm. 
Have you ever experienced a situation where the Nigerian police lived up to the saying, police is your friend? Well, the video you are about to watch right now is a mirror of such saying. Earlier today, a trending video clip captured operatives of the Lagos State Police Command sharing bottled water and biscuits to protesters in the state. The protesters had converged at the Keja Bridge in the early hours of Tuesday to begin the two-day nationwide protest. In a statement by the Force Public Relations Officer, ACP Muywa Dejobi, the police had pledged to provide protection for the protesters as well as to forestall miscreants and hoodlums from hijacking the protest. To discuss the protest, I am joined by legal consultant Bayo Sunny. Thank you for your time, Bayo. Thank you for having me. All right, now let's uh, start off with uh, looking at the legal implication of this protest. We know that before today, there was, you know, uh, a legal injunction preventing the NLC from embarking on this protest. In spite of uh, the legal directive, they still went ahead. Are we looking at uh, some sort of uh, legal, will I say, crossfire in the future on this? Well, uh, I won't say there's a legal crossfire in the future mm. because in 2023, when um, like, uh, Nigerian Labour Congress wanted to embark on this kind of protest, Nigerian government went to court, as the federal government went to court and um, obtained an interim order against NLC in 2023. That's 5th June 2023. Mm. Now, interim order it's not a perpetual injunction restraining labor from protesting. We have to get that clear. Interim order is like, it's an order you obtain pending the determination, not even the, of the substantive suit, but to show that there is an application, there is an application for interlocutory injunction pending before the court. So that means you obtain the interim order then that pending the hearing of the interlocutory application, the other party should maintain status quo. That's the essence of the interim order. So are you saying that this protest is not is, uh, it's, it cannot be branded as illegal? It's not illegal at all. I saw the letter written by the Attorney General of the Federation. And when I saw that letter, the letter written by the Attorney General of the Federation to the counsel to Nigerian Labour Congress, Mr. Femi Falano, I read that letter. And I was surprised, and I was wondering whether the Attorney General has written another procedure different from what we were taught in law school. Interim order does not last beyond 14 days. Beyond 14 days. And you obtain this order as far back as June 2023. Mm. Now, look, the issues are now in two categories. There is a procedural issue here. You obtain an order against NLC not to protest based on an agreement that the federal government signed with NLC, which the federal government has not fully implemented. That's on one side. Now, Labour has come out today to protest against the hardship that Nigerians are facing. Now, we're looking at Labour being the organized party championing this protest. There are citizens of the federal government, I mean, of this country also, that have joined this protest not necessarily members of the Nigerian Labour Congress. There are other members of different forms of uh, non-governmental organizations, too. That's the, 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 the organized uh, labor organizations that have also joined this protest. So that is a constitutional issue, because they are trying to express themselves. They're expressing the attitude they are facing. So these issues are in two categories. We shouldn't look at it from the angle of the fact that, oh, federal government obtained an order last year against labor. Now labor, in defiance of that order, has come out to protest today. No. There's a constitutional issue also, mm. which is the expression of their freedom. I mean, they have their right to freedom of expression. I, I mean, th this would lead me to ask you, I mean, just like you said, there are two uh, issues right now. There yes. is what the law, or no, the court order, yes. and then there's the right, you know, by the Constitution, your fundamental human right to protest. So um, this looks like a conundrum 
how can uh, these issues be resolved such that we don't have, uh, uh, you know, just a position of, of, of situations like this where uh, is, there, is there a border, is there a line, you know, that, that shouldn't be crossed in these areas? Look, the only line that shouldn't be crossed is to ensure, both parties must ensure, must ensure that this protest does not go violent. So we don't experience what we saw in 2020, which Nigeria police did today. I mean, the Lagos State Police Command, by ensuring that not only uh, uh, giving protection to the protesters, also giving them food, I mean, supplying them with water. So because are you saying, sorry to cut in, are you saying in spite of what the court says, you still have a right to protest? The only caveat here is uh, it shouldn't be violent. No, 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 no. What does the court say? Is there a subsisting order? That's the question. You ask the question, say, in spite of what the court says, what has, the, has the court said anything? We're talking about an order that was obtained in 2023, an interim order that, as far as I'm concerned, should have lapsed within 14 days. Because you obtained an interim order based on I mean, based on an interim application filed. Do you understand what I'm saying? Mm. Now, for the benefit of our viewers, interim order is an order you obtain from the court when you have filed a motion ex parte. That's an application that you filed without serving the other party. Asking the court to give an order to that party to maintain status quo. Now, naturally, that order will last within 14 days, after 14 days. For you to hear the interlocutory order, that's an interlocutory application, which will now be a restraining order through, throughout the lifespan of that suit before you go to perpetual injunction, restraining order. No court will grant that kind of perpetual injunction. So we are looking at it from two angles now. All this interim order, whether they obtain interim order, whether the order is still subsisting, you see, that's the question now. They've obtained an order. Does federal government obtain an order against Nigerian Labour Congress? The question is whether that order is still subsisting. I think I've answered that. Now, the second question is, is can Labour or members of members who are citizens of the Federal Republic of Nigeria entitled to their fundamental rights as enshrined in the 1999 Constitution, can they go ahead to express themselves, to express their grievances against the federal government? based on the hardship they are facing today. So it's not a matter of the fact that whether they are violating any other. We're looking at that's a procedural issue. But what they have done today is also a constitutional issue, which they have the right to do. Which they have the right to do. All right. So, uh, so, and is, so when, is we, there, when we are looking, okay. sorry to call, when we are looking at this protest, we shouldn't be looking at Nigerian Labour Congress alone. We should be seeing those members as citizens of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. So instead of trying to gag them with one um, court order or the other, I think it's important that government listens to them. Mm. That's the only way you can inter I mean, that's the only way you can communicate with the people. Listen to their grievances. You take, your station has gone around interviewing some of these protesters. I mean, a serious-minded government official should sit down and hear them out. Listen to what they are saying. That is the only way. Now, instead of gagging them with a court order, court order that I don't believe still subsists anyway. Okay. okay. Now, let's uh, quickly, before I let you go, let's look at the reason behind the protest. We know that, of course, uh, the economic hardship is biting really hard. But we're also aware that the government is making, you know, uh, some level of effort to ensure that uh, the situation is managed. Do you think that in spite of the recent efforts of the government, this protest should have held? Hmm. Look, why are we here? How did we get here? Because of some policies of the federal government. Are those policies right? I would say yes. Subsidy was removed, all right? We all believe that, I mean, we, when this present administration came into office, a lot of people, most of the aspirants also said it, that the first thing they would do is to remove subsidy, which this government has done, okay? It's good for, for the federal government to have removed subsidy, which we can't even, which, which has become a sort of mystery in our economy. However, it's also important that Nigerian Labour Congress and the Trade Union Congress ensures that federal government comes up with palliatives that will cushion the effect of subsidy removal on the Nigerian workers and citizens. So what is the basis of all this? They signed an agreement. They entered into a memorandum of understanding 
there were like 14 provisions in that agreement. Has federal government complied? Have they implemented all? Did they carry labor along? Or are they carrying labor along in the implementation? These are the issues. Mm. These are the issues. You can't clap with one hand. You can't tell me that you are implementing something, you are shaving my head behind me, and we all know that in the final analysis, the, 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 the people that will bear all those things are the common men on the streets. Look at what we're saying. We have removed subsidy as far back as how many months ago? But 30, minimum wage is still 30,000 naira. All right. Uh, Bayasani, thank you so much for your time. A legal consultant, once again, thank you. Thank you for having me. The Nigeria Customs Service has suspended the sale of seized food items over a stampede that claimed lives at its old zonal headquarters in the Yaba area of Lagos State, southwest Nigeria, last Friday. A spokesperson for the Customs, Abdullahi Maiwada, announced this in a statement. The Customs, at on Friday 20th, 2024, said it would dispose a seized food items to cushion the hardship and cost of living in the country. To start with, the custom disposed dis uh, food items at its Yaba office last Friday in the presence of all the security agencies, like the men of the Nigerian police force. Now, to discuss this, I am joined by strategy consultant Dipo Oyewali. Thank you for your time, Dipo. Thank you for having me. I mean, let me start off by asking, what is your general assessment of the uh, distribution or the sale, uh, subsidized sale of food items that seized food items by the customs? Oh, well, <laughs> honestly, I personally have mixed reactions with it because other people will tell you that uh, they were seized from legitimate business owners. Other people will tell you they were seized from legitimate business owners. Other people will tell you that they're providing a civic duty to the people seeing that they are selling these items at a very subsidized rate but i mean different strokes for different folks but we're here right now and um, so far i would commend the sale of this of the items at a subsidized rate because it's also helping to cushion the effect of um, the economic hardship that a lot of people are feeling in the country right now so for me it's it's a step in the right direction mm. Now, I mean, unfortunately, there were reports of uh, stampede and uh, lives were uh, lost in the process. What, what do you make of the process of the uh, sale itself? Yes, so that's where I personally have a challenge with them because one of the challenge, major challenges we have in our government system is lack of process management. Now, there is no reason why the process couldn't have been smooth. I mean, for a place like Lagos State, there is no reason why it shouldn't have been well, well organized. The Customs Service is a federal government agency. They report to the federal government. And there's no reason why they couldn't have collaborated with the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs to begin with. Today, we say we have a social register. Where is that register? Is it being implemented? We have some at the state level. Have they been able to see how they can collaborate with um, the governor at the state level? Go to the Ministry of Humanitarian Affairs in Lagos State, have they been able to collaborate with them? No, they've not done that. But now they're saying that they are pausing the entire exercise. And we're hoping that it is for them to rework the entire thing to see that it's a lot smoother. Now, I would personally recommend that. Everyone knows that we have 20 local governments in Lagos State, 37 LCDAs. There is no reason why we cannot have people go to their respective local governments of residency, have their names written down uh, while they're able to prove that they're residents of Lagos State, and then we can have people from the local governments go get those items for them from the customs office instead of them having to go to the local government write their names and then having to go to Yabai again to get the items from the customs office. And if the idea is that they want everything to be centralized, while you're writing the name down at the local government, you'll be given some form of slip or some form of verification to show that, yes, you're duly registered at the local government so that when you get to the customs office, they have everything lined up for local government. So you know what is allocated to your local government, and then you can access it a lot easier. But having the issue of stampede and loss of life over getting uh, food items like this, it is very tragic, and we do not want to see anything like that any longer.
Mm. Now, let's uh, look at the overall approach of the government, palliative approach of the government, both, you know, in policy and also commodity, to sort of uh, ameliorate the sufferings of Nigerians. How long do you think this can hold? Well, for me personally, as I understand the concept of palliatives, palliatives are meant to be temporary. They're not supposed to be indefinite. Uh, the whole idea behind palliatives should be, or ideally should be, while you have palliatives in place, you have strong policies and executing them at the same time in the background to ensure that the palliatives don't take longer than usual. So palliatives are supposed to be a stopgap measure. And if you say something is a stopgap measure, the idea is so that whatever you're putting in place in permanence should be done swiftly and should be done effectively. So the palliative system right now is quite welcome. I would say that the government should be hasty with whatever permanent features they're trying to put in place to ensure that this palliative system does not drag on for too long, because either we like it or not, whatever resources we're using in the palliative system is also taken from the purse of the government. Oh, yes, it is going to the people, but can we deploy some of these resources to ensure that we have a lot more uh, permanency with regards to cost of living, how people live more comfortably within our systems. Yes. So I would say that I expect the palliative measures to be a stopgap measure, and we hope that the government themselves are being hasty in their approach to see that it doesn't drag on for too long. Because ideally, the entire principle behind palliative measures is that it doesn't run indefinitely. There must be a time to halt it. Dikbo Yewale, a strategy consultant, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. In the face of the steady depreciation of the value of the Naira and the dip in the standard of living, Nigerians are crying for help to the country's president to reverse some of its policies. Now, agitations and protests have been recorded both online and offline spaces across the country while the government continues to plead for patience. New Central's Adeshewa Udushoga tells us more. Nigeria is a country with enormous economic potential, but is currently facing several difficulties that have led to widespread suffering among its people. The current predicament is complicated, but the economic hardship has since taken the cake, with outbursts and protests spreading across the nation. Hunger and anger is what describes the mood of many Nigerians across the country amidst the economic crisis at this moment. At the Keja, capital of Lagos, Nigeria, many residents are calling for help. It appears that they have had enough of the current economic crisis in the country. <laughs> The National Labour Congress is holding a series of protests across the country demanding the reversal of some economic policies of the President Junibu-led administration, which also includes the removal of fuel subsidies. This motorist says it is becoming more difficult for commuters to afford his fees. One of the most popular means of disapproval of government policies and performances in Nigeria is through protest, one that is sometimes laced with strategies or sponsored by the opposition. But in this case, the people are calling for an end to hunger drawn from the rising cost of living in the country. 
Many have also insisted not to join any form of protest, citing traumatic experiences from previous protests. This is Ghani Pawaime Freedom Park, a park that is known to be the nerve center for all forms of protest happening in Nigeria. But in an unusual turn, the site is unusually empty, even amidst the series of protests happening across Nigeria. In Lagos for News Central, Adisha Waldo Sugar. The news continues in West Africa, where crisis talks called by Senegal's President Macky Sall entered their second day on Tuesday, aimed at setting a date for a presidential poll he postponed, while civil society tried to mobilize support for a vote in the next few weeks. Senegal is grappling with its worst political crisis in decades, after Sall's last-minute deferral of the February 25th elections. The Constitutional Council overturned the delay, and Sal, whose second term expires on April 2nd and Monday, launched two days of talks to set a new date. The protest, uh, our election collective of over 100 civil society group, a called for citywide shutdowns across the country and a general strike on Tuesday, demanding the poll take place before Sal leaves office. Now, Guinea's capital was on Tuesday paralyzed on the second day of a general strike, the day before an appeal for a detailed u detained union leader was uh, released protesters are demanding. Schools, shops, markets and roads in Conakry were empty and hospitals offered only skeletal services. A confederation of the main unions had been on strike since Monday, demanding lower food prices an end to media censorship, better living conditions for civil servants and the press union activist release. Union spokesperson Amado Diallo said he was waiting for a total and complete fulfillment of all demands before ending the strike. He added that no meeting with the authorities was planned for Tuesday. French President Emmanuel Macron on Tuesday faced on easy reactions from European allies and a warning from the Kremlin after he refused to rule out the dispatch of Western ground troops to Ukraine in its fight against the Russian invasion. The spokesperson for the Spanish government, Pilar Algeria, says Spain is against any deployment of European troops in Ukraine. The Kremlin warned of the inavailability of uh, confederation confrontation between the NATO and Russia if troops from the alliance were deployed in the conflict, which would break a new taboo the West has so far been reluctant to challenge. The país también ha manifestado ya su posición en este en este aspecto. No no estamos de acuerdo y tenemos que concentrarnos además en lo urgente que es acelerar esa entrega también de, del material y, y creo eh, aquí también importante trasladar una posición que ha reiterado en numerosas ocasiones el presidente del gobierno que la unidad ha sido y es el arma más efectiva que tiene Europa frente al ataque contra contra Putin. Thousands of farmers took to the streets of the Polish capital Warsaw in protest against what they see as excessive EU environmental requirements and unfair cheap imports. European Union ministers met on Friday 26th in an attempt to streamline the rules and reduce red tape that have fueled Europe-wide protests in recent weeks. Protesters waved red and white fla Polish flags and carried banners reading, Without us, you will be hungry, naked and sober, and I am a farmer, not a slave. Some banners were also directed against Ukraine, with one saying, Take care of your family's health. Don't eat crap for Ukraine. My jesteśmy przeciwko jakimś tam e, eksportom, importom, tylko żeby to było kontrolowane, żeby Polska nie traciła, tylko żeby z tego polski rząd miał za przepływ tych towarów pieniądze. Trzeba porządek zaprowadzić, przywrócić kontrolę, żeby nie było tak, że jest samowolka z przyzwoleniem naszego państwa. Z jednej strony nam się zabrania pryskać, a z drugiej strony są wprowadzane produkty żywnościowe, które są pryskane środkami, które są u nas w Unii. And that's all on the news at this hour. But before we go, another look at some of our top stories. Of course, we told you that uh, on the news at this time that 
The CBN has raised monetary policy rates to 22.75%. Nigeria Labour Congress stages cost of living protest across the country. And also, we told you that uh, Guinea's capital, Conakry, paralyzed on day two of general strike. Don't forget, of course, uh, to send in your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. You can also follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. You can watch us live on DSTV channel 422 Star Times, channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I am Dakbo. I did Bye for now.